During the four years it was fought, it went by many names. The War for States' Rights, Mr. Lincoln's War, the War for Southern Nationality, the War for Separation, the War for Union, the War Between the States, the Second War of Independence, the Brothers' War, the Lost Cause. To historians, it became known as the American Civil War, the Civil War for short. It was a civil war in name only. Survivors of its great battles, first Bull Run, Shiloh, second Bull Run, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and Petersburg would later remember the Civil War as the last gentleman's war. That was only after hard memories had been gently effaced by time. Over a hundred years later, the Civil War remains the deadliest war ever launched in the Western Hemisphere. It was also one of history's most divisive and disastrous conflicts, tearing a nation apart and pitting brother against brother. A house divided against itself, Abraham Lincoln said, cannot stand. Yet between 1861 and 1865, the American home literally was split in two and the country torn asunder. Americans fought Americans. The lines were drawn roughly between North and South, but conflicting loyalties blurred the apparent clear distinctions. Men from the North bid their lovers farewell and donned Confederate uniforms convinced that states' rights were imperiled by the Lincoln administration. Men from Dixie kissed their mothers goodbye and headed north to join Union forces, convinced that black slavery could only be removed by force. Even the president himself experienced the war's terrible pull of loyalties. Four of Lincoln's brothers-in-law enlisted with the Confederates, and the president watched as states such as Kentucky and Delaware contributed equal numbers of willing recruits to both sides. Like so many wars, it started out with flag waving, drum beating, boasting, and high expectations. Men flooded recruiting stations, anxious to sign up. They bristled when they were forced to master rudimentary military drills on parade grounds far from the fighting, and they feared that the war would be over before they had their chance to fight and attain glory. But the Civil War lasted four years, and soldiers on both sides lived to see the folly of their merry lust for battle. And then they died. In the end, the United States lost 5% of its population in the Civil War. Most of the 600,000 killed were mere boys, extinguished by the flames of war, along with hundreds of thousands of troops, were the tranquil dreams of families from Florida to Maine and from Virginia to California. But out of the ashes arose a better union, forever changed. No longer was it one part free, one part slave, but that was in the end, after the blood had been let and the casualties piled high in the nation's terrible and dark atonement. The Civil War officially commenced on April 12, 1861, when Confederate forces under General B.T. Beauregard bombarded a Union fort in South Carolina's Charleston Harbor. But the profound tensions and deep-seated hostility between North and South and behind the disastrous conflict that would engulf the nation had been festering for a long time. Long before the southern states began seceding from the Union and forming the Confederate States of America, there were in fact already two Americas, or at least two separate cultures, slowly but inevitably growing apart. The North, was a fast-growing urban industrial region, 
the South, a rural, agricultural, slow-growing region. As the North's population swelled through immigration, the South remained static. What was good for the North was not always good for the South. The high tariffs on foreign goods, set by several administrations in Washington, for example, protected young industries in the Northwest, but hurt Southern cotton growers, who, dependent as they were on cotton exports, desperately needed cheap foreign goods to fulfill their material needs. Cotton was king. The Southerners never tired of pointing that out, accounting for some 57% of all American exports. High tariffs in America only invited high tariffs on American cotton, prohibiting export and effectively shutting down the Southern economy. Unfortunately, trade policy wasn't the only issue dividing North and South. The connection between cotton and slavery was beginning to weigh heavily on certain consciences in the North. During the 1830s and 1840s, opposition to slavery spread throughout the Northeast and abolitionist societies and newspapers were established in many cities and states. At first, the anti-slavery forces merely opposed the extension of slavery into more United States territory and hoped that the South's peculiar institution would gradually wither and die in the states where it was already established. Over time, however, the abolitionists grew in numbers and their demands became more far-reaching. The problem was that slavery was essential to the southern cotton industry. When abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison called for an end to black servitude, cotton planters heard him calling for the end of their livelihoods. Southerners resented the abolitionists and the sympathetic hearing they seemed to be getting from the influential policymakers in the North. Blacks made up 40% of the South's population and were reckoned to be worth some $2 billion to the Southern economy. As the abolitionists raised their voices higher and higher, demanding an end to Southern slavery without ever talking about compensation, Southerners began talking about states' rights as a tactic to protect themselves from the federal government, which they considered a body controlled by hostile enemies. While abolitionists argued that Congress had the duty to prohibit slavery wherever it could, the Southerners demanded not only that Congress had no power to prohibit the peculiar institution, but that it had the duty to protect it the lines were clearly drawn. The festering hatred and suspicion came to a head in 1854 with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. According to the law, citizens in the new states of Kansas and Nebraska would decide for themselves whether they would have slavery or not. This idea of popular sovereignty, though an attempt to defuse the explosive issue of slavery by putting it in the hands of the new states, touched off mad immigration to the two new territories as pro and anti-slavery forces attempted to get to the states first. As they scrambled to gain an upper hand, the abolitionists and the Southern sympathizers armed themselves and clashed. The territory became known as Bleeding Kansas as opponents staged raids on one another. It was in Kansas that John Brown, the radical anti-slavery crusader, first drew blood. At the so-called Padawanami Massacre, Brown murdered at least five Southern settlers. Later, in 1859, Brown attempted to spark off a slavery insurrection by seizing a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in Virginia and issuing weapons to blacks. Although Brown was quickly forced to surrender 
His plot had killed the town's southern mayor and spread panic in the south. Looking at developments in Kansas and at Brown's bloody-mindedness in both Kansas and Virginia, Southerners feared that their very livelihoods were at stake. They developed a hardline attitude towards slavery and up the ante, insisting that slavery would either be protected and extended into all new territories in the Union, or they would be forced to secede to protect themselves. When Abraham Lincoln, running on the platform supporting protective tariffs and opposing the extension of slavery, won the 1860 presidential election with a whopping 180 electoral votes, the fears of Southerners seemed to be confirmed. The overthrow of Southern society by Northern agitators who controlled the federal government appeared imminent. The South swiftly reacted to the perceived threat. On Christmas Eve, 1860, South Carolina declared its independence, quickly followed by Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. On the 8th of February, 1861, delegates from the seven rebel states met in Montgomery, Alabama, and formed the Confederate States of America. Electing Jefferson Davis, a former soldier, senator, and secretary of war as Confederate president. The twin pillars of the new nation were states' rights and the legality of slavery. Attempts to bring the seven states back into the Union by compromise failed, and the Confederates began seizing federal arsenals and forts in their territory. It was against this background of coming war that Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as president on March 4th, 1861. As the grim president and his entourage walked towards the White House, onlookers said it seemed more like a funeral than a celebration of victory. Although Lincoln made peaceful overtures to the South on that cold, glum day, his speech was a thinly veiled warning in your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, is the momentous issue of civil war. You can have no conflict without yourselves being the aggressor. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. The South ignored Lincoln's ominous tone Earlier, the Confederate States had resolved to take Forts Sumter and Pickens, the last two remaining federal installations in the Confederate States. Major Anderson, the U.S. soldier in charge at Fort Sumter, was asked by the Confederates to surrender the fort. When Anderson refused, the Confederates prepared to bomb him out. On April 12th, 1861, at 4 a.m., the first shots rang out in the Civil War as Confederate General B.T. Beauregard pummeled the fort with a massive artillery bombardment. <laughs> 